All right, so let's delve into the, the workshop. We'll finish out what we've been doing. Um, I mean, we can still talk in chat. I, I love it. I love discussion. I love conversation. Um, and Derek, if you have a story to tell, hey, I'm looking forward to hearing it over here too. There are guidelines to creating a campaign in the Dungeon Master's Guide. And when I say even creating a campaign, it could just be an adventure. It could be a one-shot. We could just say content. Creating content in the DMG. For tonight, we're, we're not necessarily going to use that. We've done a lot of random number generation. And I want to introduce the concepts. And I, I want to show you, you know, Rhodey... Anyone else who's a writer, Victor, if you're looking for inspiration, you can find it here. In fact, if you wanted to plan a science fiction RPG session, you can use the storytelling techniques and the concepts that you find in the D&D Dungeon Master's Guide. It's, pardon me, it's universal. There's solid advice in here. And I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go through and read this whole thing. I, I want to introduce it to you here, it's chapter three, starting in page seventy one. There's a lot of solid advice for you here, and I would highly recommend if you are a DM to pick it up and and peruse it. Heck, Rody, if you don't intend on running D and D, but you want writing inspiration in how to and how to craft a story, how to weave things together. Pick up the Dungeon Master's Guide and use it as a writing guide. Especially if you're already familiar with role-playing, and that's a convenient medium to get concepts through to you in a way that might not seem uh, detached or academic or sterile in some other fashion. You know, we for the dungeon, we rolled a dungeon goal, and there's wilderness goals, there's other goals, there's adventure patrons, adventure villains, and of course we use this in order to influence the villains that we created. There's different allies that you can have come along, a disguised monster, an inexperienced adventurer. Yes, MacGruber. Um, uh, in fact, MacGruber, um, Rody posted something similar um, asking if, uh, if I could create a character inspiration stream uh, where folks can post, you know, like character art and, and things like that to, you know, try and get some juices flowing. Uh, in the old uh, in the old uh, brain case, so you know MacGruber, you and Rody had similar ideas in in two different fashions. It's all storytelling, Rody. Maybe in a different way, but it's all storytelling. So, do you need a hook for your adventure? How do you get a group of, of five people like this together? Now, I, we don't have to use it for what we're going to be doing here. But, roll a d12. Number 11. One night, the characters all dream about it, uh, it, um, entering the adventure location. Congratulations, Madames and Monsieurs, you have your hook. You have your introduction. Use that as a prompt and go with it. Right? Sometimes we feel less pressure if we take the, the stress of coming up with it ourselves off of our hands. Some of us might be more reactive thinkers. You know, so uh, a prompt occurs and we react more than being a proactive thinker. There's nothing wrong with that. So in this case, charts like this can help you with inspiration because you're leaving the origin idea out of your control, but you do feel more comfortable being in control of how to like massage or manipulate that information to then weave it into whatever you want to do. 
right? Here's your adventure climax. Uh, you know, if we were to roll this for our uh, for our adventure, right? If we want to create a quick and dirty outline, we could do so here. It's not that hard to do. Just go, go by the numbers. Interpret the results as you will, and that's fine. Customize the results, but take the the core concept and and put it on paper. You know what? If you don't like it, roll the dice again and go through a new prompt. Eventually, you're going to have to just stop and stick with something because there, there will never be a perfect story. There will never be a perfect circumstance. Um, I mean, you have five players that have known each other since kindergarten. You know, they're, they're all in their mid-30s or whatever now, in their 40s. You know, they all, they all live together. They work together. They get along fantastically. And you, and then, a, you know, you as a DM step up, you're like, oh, man, this is going to be fun. Everyone knows each other. They seem they're solid characters. They all really like each other. And then you throw out a story hook, and it just pfft, session session one just flies out the window of what you had expected. So adaptive storytelling is important. So we rolled a two. The adventures the adventurers chase the villain while dodging obstacles designed to thwart them, leading to a final confrontation in or outside the villain's refuge. So there you go. Part of the final fight is a chase sequence. And by the way, chase sequences are in the DMG. If you need inspiration. I mean, I, I, I don't know offhand, King, because I haven't had an opportunity to look at it. Although I will say, Victor, a magic point system does exist as an alternative in the Dungeon Master's Guide if you're looking to use that instead of spell slots. Yeah, Victor, you're fine. Um, yeah, you're not getting beat up. Look, King is offering you help because he wanted to help you, and you know it, it's good advice. It's solid advice. This isn't being ganged up on. This isn't bullying. This isn't getting beaten up. Um, you know, as a content creator, you know, I'll speak this as a content creator on Twitch and YouTube or whatever. Um, you know. People might not like what you publish, or they might feel confused and say, I don't understand this. And and they don't understand that you might have stayed up all night. You spent 12 hours making this document. And in your mind, everything is watertight. And then someone reads it and says, I, I just don't get it. Don't take it personally. Foc you focus on the work, and the person helping you focuses on the work, and let's work on the work. Don't take it as a personal attack one way or the other. Let's resolve the work that you put that time into to create and get it into a, an understandable format to improve it and to be better. Uh, McGruber? I, I mean, yeah, I look, if King was, if, if King was going over the top and saying, you know, he's calling you names, and it, it just turned into an unproductive slam fest. Then, obviously, that we've moved from critique or suggestion, um, or you know, you know, um, constructive criticism into just being demeaning, and that doesn't help anyone. And obviously, I mean, I, I'd step in there, but King hasn't been making funny or anything. Um. You know, he hasn't been like bullying you like, oh, what, what, what's this garbage? I'm going to wipe my butt with it or something. Um, you know, if he's saying stuff like that, then that's not appropriate. And you have and you and you would, uh, you know, have the right to feel like you're being personally attacked because he's attacking you. He's not even talking about your material that you presented. But if we're talking about the material, it's not personal because it's not an attack against you. Yeah. You know, it, it's a reflection of the content you created. 
But jeez, we're all flawed creatures, Victor. We all have our flaws. Uh, I Did you see up here earlier where I was correcting spelling mistakes? For words that are common in the English language? Let alone the... F I, and I understand that uh, English is not your first language also. And I respect that, Victor. You know, so here even I was having to go back and um, and fix some spelling errors. Because, you know, when, we're, when you get in a creative mood and the words are flowing and, oh, this... It happens. And if, if it gets pointed out, hey, someone did you a favor. Gareth, hey, welcome aboard, sir. It's good to see you again. Uh, I hope you and uh, and all the other folks over, uh, over in your group have been doing well. Uh, Happy New Year to you all, by the way. Viking says food. Yeah, Diadem's had a very, uh, a very exciting, adventurous moment. Uh, he shared it on uh, on the on the Discord. You can always retell it here if you want, Diadem's. That was quite the fight. You played this past Friday and managed to trick a banker into giving me a dead man's bank account. Oh wow. Yeah, DMs, we were finding spelling errors in Matt Colville's uh, Strongholds and Followers supplement. You're absolutely correct. You are absolutely correct. And Viking, well, you, I, you, I guess you said butts, uh, but it emoted as several. All right, Victor, hey. Play test it, refine it, always be open. You know, even if you feel like it's finished, hey, look, look at the DMG or in particular the player's handbook. The player's handbook has had several versions of errata that have uh, supplemented it because the original presentation wasn't complete or solid. You know, things that you thought took a lot of play testing and it did just didn't work out even after all these years at fifth edition i mean i make it sound like it's it's 10 years old or something but after all the years all the all the money all of the experts that have been working on this and look at the huge errata revision that we got in, at the end of 2018 it happens look at magic the gathering having to ban cards because of whoops <laughs> whoops I've never made a spelling mistake ever, says Viking. I have made plenty of grammar whoopsies, though. Uh, Gareth asks, Oh, did you see they're doing up the Artificer again next month for Unearthed Arcana? It would be interesting to see what's changed uh, between the original and the, um, and the suggested one. Or the next set of suggested ones. So, getting through here, tons, tons of awesome writing prompts for you as the DM who wants to write a, an adventure. How does the villain act? You might have an awesome villain, and you just don't know, you know, it could be between three things. So roll a die between the three, and just go with it. Stick with it. You can make it work. You're a human being. You're a storyteller. Intrinsically, you're a storyteller. You have the ability... To, to make it happen. All right, Victor. Be well. We'll see you around. All right? Here are things to consider. If you are if you're writing for a villain, what would a villain do? How would a villain think? Maybe you don't have a lot of experience writing evil content. 
Mm. All right. Are you writing a one and done? Is it a series of growing corruptions? Serial crimes. All right. We get into identifying important NPCs. Anticipate the villain's reactions. You want help on, on writing a mystery? You want to run a mystery adventure? An intrigue adventure. How about that? It's all addressed here for you. Please use the DMG. You want an opener that isn't just the dream or, you know, it accents the dream or it just replaces the dream that we randomly rolled. Framing events. You can base an entire adventure on a framing event or use such an event to grab the player's interest. The framing events uh, table presents several ideas. So we open, uh, this isn't the story that I'm going to make over here. We open this sample adventure out of the DMG and all of the characters who are staying in each of their hotel rooms or houses or wherever they're at have a vision of the adventure location. You narrate it and you allow for each of the players to mull this information. And as a DM, you give the PCs an opportunity to, um, to act on it. Now, what's going to draw them together, right? You set the stage. Um, you know, we've had that in media res kind of um, action, um, but no explanation. And wouldn't you know, the the player character wakes up and it's the millennial fair. Uh, that's a Chrono Trigger reference. No, but seriously, let's roll a percentile. 94. What is 94 here? A trial. All right, so here we go. They all live somewhere around Apogea. They have a dream. And we can even have it be that... Um, we can have it be that dungeon, right? That underground fort that was uh, occupied by these not quite undead, but soulless soldiers. What does it mean? No one knows. No one's seen it. In fact, it's not even going to get uncovered for the next couple days. I mean, you know that as the DM. But you know what? Today is the big trial. Um, a notorious criminal. And you might even have to come up with this on the fly. I don't know. A notorious criminal has been captured, and today is his trial. And uh, everyone probably knows it's just going to be like a public hanging or something along those lines. And you ask each of your players, I want you to tell me a reason why your character would come to this big, important trial. So now we have our players together. <clears throat> and we proceed from there. You want to throw in some moral quandaries? Because moral quandary... Look, moral uh, a moral quandary makes for a really good final fight. I mean, yeah, there's a boss fight with the main villain. But um, really, the, the moral decision at, uh, that can come at the end of a campaign, even an adventure or a module of some kind, that can really have the characters writhing. All right, MacGruber, be well, my friend. Thank you for the suggestions. And um, thank you for uh, adopting some minis. Ah. Reltec, all right, you're taking out two? Be well, thank you. And hey, Reltec, you can find the videos if you want to watch the campaign and catch up. Uh, you can find the videos on the YouTube channel, or if you come over to the uh, to our Discord here, and you come down to Tuesday Roleplay Campaign 1, you can find a text summary of each of the episodes, but you can also find the episodes in video format. Right, it's it's on a playlist that uh, you know you could just set it to play through if you if you wanted to watch and catch up and, and be a part of it. Oh yeah, oh look at that daily, huh? Huh. Yeah, thank you. Have fun with it. You know, you um. You could watch it, but you could even have it going on in the background if you have to do some chores, drive around, um, you know, wash some dishes, uh, and, you know, 
you don't have to actively watch because we do try and narrate a, a, a much of what we do. So it'd be almost like a radio drama. You want plot twists? I'll give you a plot twist. Here we go. Two. The adventurers become responsible for the safety of a non-combatant NPC. So, oh, and thank you very much for that YouTube subscription. And so here we go. Um, at a critical moment. You know, just, ah, oh, one more thing. Can we do it? How, how do we get through this? We have to watch after this brat or this dog or whatever. A rare sentient plant that's the last of its kind. And everyone's too nice to let it die. Hmm? What a twist. Side quests. Advice on creating encounters. It is all here, everyone. It is all here. Have you wondered how do you create a balanced monster encounter? 82. Page 82. It's right there for you. Now, balanced is... That that concept has a little bit of squishiness. Right? It has a margin to it. Because unpredictable things can happen. Um, who knows? But a good, solid guideline for creating balanced-ish encounters is there for you. It'll be like a soap opera. Everyone will get amnesia and find out they have a secret twin. <laughs> yeah. Have a great night, Reltech. Thank you for finding us, giving us a chance, and becoming a part of our community. It means a lot to me, and I hope that you have a lot of fun. And so while I won't be broadcasting the next couple nights, when we come back on Tuesday, you know, we provide a recap of recent events also. Um, and so you could just jump right in and enjoy. And you can even do some side role play in chat while we uh, broadcast as well. Heh, <laughs> this happened on Thursday. Anyway. So, all kinds of stuff here. It's all here for you. Do you need it? Maybe not all of it. Maybe some of it. Maybe you have all of it figured out, but, oh, you need that... What's the catalyst? What's... Where? The hook. Use it as a supplement. Or use it fully as a roadmap for your campaign. It's here for you. I, I can't extol the virtues enough. Cheers. A nice black cherry soda. It tastes really good, even though it's a generic brand. Also, no caffeine, so I won't be jittery. Anyway, all kinds of stuff, and, and look and look where this butts into. The practices we've, we've already had. All right, so. make this at least 18 point font so you all can read it a little uh, hopefully a little bit easier on your screens um I, I think 18 has has been working but if this font isn't uh big enough for you to conveniently be able to read let me know um you know th that's part of the visual broadcast of of the um you know of what we do but uh you know i try and narrate as much as we can all right The core of your story should be able to be summarized in one, maybe two sentences. What is the entire point of what you want to present? I bring up some examples from some published adventures, but I think some of you are going through various adventures. Um...
I wonder if I can sort of make something. Sure, let's take Curse of Strahd. I'm not going to spoil anything for you, right? Curse of Strahd, you have this, uh, you have a vampire sitting uh, on the front cover of the book. You know, looks kind of amused, drinking wine, has these uh, tarot cards. Well, Taroka, technically. The Curse of Strahd. The point of the Curse of Strahd is to overcome Strahd von Zarovich. You know, defeat Strahd. Two words. Now, those two words, everything in that supplement should build towards eventually defeating Strahd. We could say for Tomb of Annihilation, there's probably a place called or referred to or otherwise thought of as the Tomb of Annihilation. It would appear that a summary of Tomb of Annihilation is reach the Tomb of Annihilation and overcome the challenge. One sentence. Hey, it's Katie Sue. Welcome. Welcome. <coughs> Ooh, pardon. Everything in Tomb of Annihilation is working to get you towards that goal. And so when the this adventure has been plotted out, even if it's only one or two steps, or even a sidestep, that may not advance you towards the goal, but will somehow accelerate your goal because of the circumstances. So you didn't make the slow, steady progress. You took a step to the side, but now you can really, woo! Now you can really roll. In fact, my Thursday players are doing something just along those lines. They've taken a side step, and uh, it's taken some of their time, but it might just save them a whole lot of time and effort later because of the events that have occurred. And if you don't want spoilers, don't read the, the tomb diary that I have on, on our Discord. So... Make sure you're using this as a lighthouse on stormy seas of creativity, of, of your brain stormy seas. If we take a look at the material we've generated, our big bad evil guy is a leader of a cult. In fact, that's the current calamity that's going on right now. There's a cult going through that's trying to break people's faiths, stir up some trouble. You can have the point of the story be uh, I don't know if we ended up giving our, our villain a, a name um, but we can just say you know uh, defeat the warlock's patron to stop the crumbling of Apogean <clears throat> society. Or, and or, if all the characters are more or less a vehicle to convey a moral point, instead, you could write something like this. Explore the nature of divinity and whether or not one can exist for themselves or must instead Submit to a greater supernatural power. So that's more of a moral or a philosophical point that you want to make with your campaign. Right? In, in our talks, the cult was coming around. And I know that, that, there's, a, that there's a hypocrisy or an irony to it. Uh, because they follow a patron, and the patron's granting them these powers. But of course, in their circumstances, it has to be different than people who just blindly follow a god. Naturally, right? <coughs> oh, pardon me. 
either of these sentences can still get you from point A to point B. But one or the other is going to change the tone of the campaign. One might feel a little bit more of a, of a moral or philosophical exploration. Um, not that there won't be combat and sword swinging and healing spells and monsters. It'll still be there. But you're trying to pursue that philosophical point more than, here's the big bad guy in front of you. I'm going to dangle this carrot in front of you all. And you need to, you know, the party needs to go and chase down this pinata. And once the pinata split open for candy, you all win and we have a good time. And I, I, I'm not saying that in a crass fashion because that's a fun way to play, right? There are some villains that you, ooh, <laughs> they're a pinata, all right. Uh, they're, they're a colorful target and you just want to wail on them. And it's so satisfying to do. Um, so I, I'm not saying that to uh, to put down different storytelling techniques, but just like I said, it it will change your delivery method and it'll change how you might think about presenting content in your story. Hey, Delcor. No, no, I said in Discord it was just going to be pushed back a little bit. Um, I had... Uh, um, I had some uh, some hosting that I needed to uh, to be polite about. I'm not saying that in an underhanded fashion, but it's the weekend, uh, and there were other things that I had to focus on uh, before the stream, and to make sure that I was doing it properly and I was being a good host. Such as it was, I gave you all notification the stream would be late, and after I took care of things, and I'm here with you all. Well, Delcorin, you're going to have to flip a table or something for me, bud. Come on. <laughs> so we've, we've created this concept. Um, you know, if you want to put some sort of a sub goal, uh, it could be also philosophical or physical. Uh, it could be explore the nature of the history of Apogea, which was one of conflict. It was one of, um, you know one side of the mountain versus the other nature versus the arcane which led to destruction and therefore peace because people realized they couldn't do it anymore so they all came together under divine divine magic this overarching remote influence not a personal one not from the earth upon which we walk or the very ether that uh, that you know flows through us but is gifted from a deity on high a deity that we can all follow, regardless of which side of the mountain you lived on. And that brought about peace. In fact, that's even how we explained why humans were a new species coming about. Because humans were kind of the generic, like, the races coming together. Humans are the half race, kind of, in how we're conceptualizing things. Pardon. So this is another idea that can be explored over the course of this adventure. What's the nature of the people who live in Apogea? Of their faith? Of their history? Oh, cool. Well, hey, I'm, I'm glad you got to uh, I'm glad you got to see the work of uh, the voice actor you like, Del. <clears throat> so we have our lighthouse. We have this guiding uh, philosophy, this sentence that will encourage us to, even if we have to, to go off the, the script, is still gonna eventually want, you know, take us to the end. You know, if we talk about adventure hooks a fish can start out half a mile from a boat, depending on how much line you let out you know it's, it's supposed to eventually reach the boat, even if it's swimming back and forth, if it's jumping it goes under the boat, it goes everywhere you're constantly reeling constantly reeling constantly reeling even if it's slow right you don't want the line to break but that slow steady progress pull real 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 pull real 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 there are cycles of activity and inactivity all these metaphors pinatas carrots on sticks uh fishing rods um however whatever works best for you based on your experience but set this up Right, so here, here's our overarching goal. Now, again, we, we could have gone through with the charts. Look, I trust you. If you wanna if you wanna take this concept, in fact, this is my challenge to you. Right, Derek was talking about uh, challenging with NPCs and stuff earlier. 
Here's my challenge to you. Arguably, we could just end the workshop here and say that this is the prompt for the campaign outline. You have the villains. You have the dungeon. You have the NPCs. You have the map, including sort of like a little uh, regional, like cultural spoiler. <clears throat> and you have the five characters that are, are going to be going on this adventure. Um, and, you know, you don't have to model the, you know, you, well, you can model a story for the characters specifically because you now have that party worksheet available to you as well. Um, but even if you're just talking generically, you have five people who are going to go on an adventure in this area, whether they're from here or not, and are going to explore this this information, this culture, um, the economics that occur here, which uh, which are interesting. And so that's my challenge is here. Our campaign outline is for you to make based on all of the prompts, because I'll tell you, with this, if I gave each of you the same information, I just sent it out in a document bundle to, to all of you, and I said, this is your goal. I want you to give me a 10 milestone adventure. Doesn't even have to be a full 20 level. If you want to make it 20, you can. Here's your minimum homework. All the tools are already necessary because just little bit by little bit, we've been making the world around us and we've been coming up with compelling uh, plot elements and NPCs and villains that are that are already woven into the area and the players and the story that we want to tell. Because all of this, this is a result of everything that has come before. And so for your players, it's going to be in reverse, right? You as a DM already know what's, what's going to happen. You know the end game. You know what the goal is. And so now it's just, you know, letting it out little bit by little bit. Reverse engineering what you know the climax of the story is going to be. Whether or not it is that, um, it is that chase that leads to the, the, the villain's lair or whatever. And we could use that if you want. You know, you can go through and label and, and you know, you could say that this milestone is the hook. And so here's the climax. You can just arbitrarily say, um, you know, this is a little bit of setup. Now, right now we're solid. Uh, and here at, at seven, the twist. Could you put it as the level six milestone? Sure, why not? If you want to continue building, you know, you could list things as, you know, I really want a fight. And I really want a sub boss battle. It's like a more difficult fight, but maybe against like one beefier opponent than several small fry. I want this to be a social interaction milestone. Just put ideas out there, even broad, and then work on focusing them and connecting them. It's all out there for you. All right. Here's all our resources that we've been making. Our party worksheet. You know, so we have a people of devotion to themselves, people of devotion to a faith. Um, we have this uh, dungeon that we're going to need to work in someplace as well. Um, with the dungeon came the revelation that uh, the big bad evil guy of this adventure is actually this cult that's been, uh, you know, so we, we build up the mystery. And you could layer your milestones this way too. You know, so here we still have uh, mystery introduced. Um, deal with consequences of mystery. Look at uh, Secret of Mana. The mystery's introduced. Like, there's this, there's this uh, sword that's stuck in a stone at the base of a waterfall. And then things happen. You end up there. You pull a sword from the stone. You're not the king of England, but that's what that's what was sealing away monsters, right? And now the game turns into like sort of fun-loving adventure outside your home village. 
into there's monsters around because you have to deal with the consequences. So deal with consequences of uh, of the mystery. And in fact, that could even be like a setup and a resolution. Uh, deal part two. By this point, then, uh, part of those consequences um, uncover the dungeon. So dungeon uh, uncovered. So that's going to lead to the intro uh, well, to, to the mystery of the cult now. So we can uh, this might explain why things weird things have been happening. It's not just because now there's this weird place that is manifested or uh, or um, you know come around that the monsters are starting to uh, to be attracted to apogea or it's causing societal distress, kind of like um negative like a, a negative air, just like negative thought waves, just sort of wobbling all around. No one can see it, but it's really making everyone sour. That's a societal threat. That's an economic threat. Doesn't always just have to be monsters, but it can be monsters if you want it to be. Emotional vampires. Or, um, hey, in Ravnica, you have mind drinker vampires. Yeah, how about that? Hey, it's Fluffy Sheep. Welcome. All right, be well, Victor. See you around. Dungeon uncovered. Um, cult investigation. Ooh, pardon me. The cult is being investigated, and um, cult takes action directly against the party. Right? Because the party's on the radar now, and they're snooping around. Um, reversal of fortune. Well, I guess that, that, that would come later. Uh, party proves themselves to the community that offers, I don't know, money, weapons, information, offers backing. <clears throat> Uh, from here, we can... And, and sprinkle throughout here, again, we're just talking vague concepts in, in order. And you can you can have things like fight, social interaction, and whatnot as tags that also write along uh, in another sentence alongside these. Oh, yeah, it, it's Saturday. You had a crazy session? What happened, Fluffy Sheep? Uh, takes the fight to the cult. Uh, probably another dungeon where they go into the, they infiltrate the cult. Um, or at least what, where they think the cult operates out of. Um, it was a ruse and false dungeon. Um, cult takes action against the community in a final ploy. And of course, then the party must overcome that until finally um, all is revealed <clears throat> about the cult, including the location of the main villain and his patron. Big boss fight. Congratulations. Presumably by the end of the adventure... You know, so we've approached this on the level of, well, would this qualify as a social interaction level, uh, you know, or mostly featuring that? Not that there couldn't be a skirmish or a, a random fight or something. Is it a meaningful fight, a boss fight, a sub boss? And if you want now, right, so we have this information. Now, what if you go through and you make a third sentence or you break it down in some way? <laughs> to where you want to track the introduction of thoughts or characters. You know, whether it's 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 the philosophy, if you want to pursue the one-sentence philosophy above, or if you want to uh, introduce physical characters 
uh, that the character that your players might get into a tussles with, right? So here, this is the hook. The characters are going to meet each other. And after that, well, we have our we have our list of NPCs. We have Bernal Groms, uh, who is that halfling lone shark. Um, Javier uh, uh, Rekakama de Cobb, uh, who is the noble who is uh, who is like a cousin to one of the players, but is also a love interest to another. And so here we can uh, we can start going down our roster. So we have our hook. Maybe at the trial, um, this is where uh, they. Meet Javier, who asks them about something. About something is perfectly fine. This is all brainstorming. What? Are we out graphite? Are we out ink? We're just out some electrons. Not too bad at all. Uh, King says, I've always enjoyed the piecemeal world building presented by old video games. Not necessarily their intended lore, but their implied lore. Uh, I, I think I understand what you're getting at, King, but can you give an example? Fluffy Sheep says, The party completed part two of the raid on the mayor's mansion. They discovered that the government has been infiltrated by body snatchers, defeated the reanimated corpse of the mayor. Was that the flesh golem that was stuffed in the food closet in the pantry? And managed to set the mansion on fire and get out with their lives, but not without being seen. And yeah, Rody, dun dun dun! <laughs> and um and so i i shame on me i should have been uh I, I think i should have just been building the concepts um one one sentence at a time going down through the steps and then uh, one concept at a time going over but you can see now where you can introduce your your because we're building right we're building an outline we're starting with a skeleton, now we're adding muscles, and then we're going to add uh, flesh, and then we can put details like freckles and hair or whatever um, all, all around it. We, we're, we're dressing it up from the, the bottom up so it's stable. It makes sense. But we have our roster of NPCs. Uh, in fact, it might not be until uh, until later, maybe just before the twist, because this is what the, the twist uh, brings along. Um, this is where they end up meeting. Where's our lone shark? They meet Bernal. Maybe, maybe they, they've they heard of Bernal. Um, so in, in this case, uh, you know, Bernal sends messages. But uh, Bernal reveals herself whoop, fully. Uh, yes, Rody. It's technically a construct and not an undead. But you know what? It's your world. If you want it to be undead, it's undead. Intended lore being dialogue relating directly to what every player knows. The mana beast will destroy the mana fortress while it holds the world's mana and will therefore destroy the world. And implied lore being things you have to discern by the location of items, enemies, terrain, NPCs. Ah, gotcha. Yep, yep, yep. Very good example there. Whew, sorry, I got a shift in my seat. My, my back's killing me today. Um... You know, at, at the point where we had our dungeon, um, the villain wasn't necessarily, at least the boss, I don't want to say villain, because he's been bad the whole time. Like, he's just aggressively neutral, or uh, he's neutral and aggressive. You know, so here we would have the introduction of the general that we generated. And at the same time, this is where we hand things off to the leader of the cult, uh, or of the cult, um, as he makes an appearance. Uh, in fact... Uh, for really good storytelling along these lines, kind of what I'm describing, take a look at the story of Re in Resident Evil 4 and how that unfolds and how you meet NPCs and how you meet villains and how you get to know them and how the story of what happened in the village takes place. In fact, uh, you know, as, as King was talking about implied and, and direct lore, 
you can get a lot of information in Resident Evil 4 built along those lines. You know, and you think that uh, that the the leader of the village is the big bad evil guy, and he's not. And then you meet someone you, who you think next is the big bad evil guy, and he might be. But then there's this other person in a castle. And you're like, well, this is, the, is this a big bad evil guy? Meme drag, welcome. And so you have this progressive series of of events and villains and dungeons and combats and survival. Uh, Resident Evil 4 could be a very good storytelling template to use in a, as a, a, an adventure guide, as a, a campaign uh, pl uh, a campaign plotting uh, inspiration. Right, if you want to go through, and you want to have, uh, and you want to make sure that you're touching on or triggering different aspects of your player characters right if your players made these characters and are happy with them and they're consenting that yes these are their flaws and these are these are their their strengths and all that you can then also go through and by level especially given the other circumstances like i don't know no one no one in the party is necessarily claustrophobic i mean a player might say that they're you know they add that to their character but maybe you take that design consideration into the dungeon and you play on that flaw. You can go through and add a subtle or very direct spotlight for each of the characters with the events of that milestone. Technotron, well, howdy to you. Uh, you might be held up in ad purgatory, I, I don't know offhand. But still, thank you for the raid, Technotron. I'll say it again, too, when you manifest fully over here. Meme Drag, it's going very well tonight. Uh, it's the culmination of uh, two weeks worth of workshops. Um, you know, we're talking concepts, we're talking storytelling, we're, we're empowering our imaginations, and, um, and we're really... Um, we're, we're drawing on so many different resources, not in a confusing fashion, but in a way that does really pull everything together. Little raid. No, no, no. It's fine, Tecna. Thank you for the raid. I very much appreciate it, brother. Uh, King says, consider this. In Final Fantasy IV, when you get to the moon, you're assaulted by waves of sorcerers and warrior maidens. These are all inside of the Lunarian Crystal Palace. Therefore, it's implied that the uh, that uh, they're Lunarians who sided with Zamus against Final Fantasy IV is not Earth. Right? Because they're not um, Aurora Rose and Puddin'. Maybe a nice tapioca. Oh, butterscotch. That's the way forward. Yeah, so King, that's an excellent example, and I appreciate you, uh, you you sharing that. That's true, yeah. So the monsters that exist there, you know, you don't get like a Pokedex entry on them necessarily. But if you stop and think, they were designed specifically in that way. They were placed there specifically by the programmers. Why? Was it just random? Why are there dragons on the moon? Hmm, the plot thickens. Like a pudding. They're popular with the necromancy set, like the BMW of necromancers. You don't really fit in until you have your own, says Fluffy Sheep. <laughs> you gotta know the difference between a bimmer and a beamer. Right? And remember, all of the points you're making here throughout... In the, uh, we conceptualize 10 levels of milestones. You want to do a full 20? Run this sucker 1 to 20. You you have all of the material here to do it. Or at least you have the foundation. Make a couple extra villains, a couple extra dungeons. You already know how to do it. Don't get me started on FF4 lore or we'll be here all night, says King. Uh, Roar Rose, I was wrong. It was a long time ago. It wasn't pudding. It was flan. Ooh, flan. Ah, the Flan Princess. Uh-oh, Aurora Rose is uh, 
Aurora Rose is is um uh, is uh trying to enchant King to open up about the lore of four. So yeah, you know, as you go here, how how would uh let's see, you 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 say that Palanka, you want to sort of tap a personality trait of Palanka in this level. And uh, and you go to I'm incredibly slow to trust those who seem the fairest often have the most to hide. This is probably where they meet an NPC. And how does then that go against, or go like go towards, your campaign goal, right? We have more of the the philosophical goal. If we want to approach it that way. Or more of the physical, like, defeat the Warlock's patron to stop the crumbling of Apogee and society. Because Apogee and society is built on trust. Trust, and trust is being challenged by these Warlocks that are sowing the seeds of dissent. And making people self-reliant instead of looking up to a, a remote deity to receive their inspiration, their humility, their humanity, and the like. So the warlocks see that they're they're setting people free. Or maybe in in this chapter or this milestone, you want to tap into Palanka's uh where she uh has ill-gotten gains that go to support her family. Maybe they've been paid for doing a job, or they they find something. And you know, and when I say a milestone, I don't mean one session. We a milestone could take months. One or more. Depending on how often you play, right? What you want to do. But you could shine a spotlight on Polanka and have her visit her family. Maybe bring the others along. Maybe she doesn't want to because she doesn't trust them. So now we're exploring that as well. But we're having a breakthrough moment. And we realize philosophically we're building the argument to be resolved by the end of the game can you exist can you be empowered without having to um subject yourself to a deity ironic or hypocritical as it is for the warlocks who have a patron and of course being a villain you know they'll, they'll give their logical reasons well it's not the same it's not nearly the same You know, we're choosing. We're uh, we're going into this with our eyes open. We're willingly entering into a contract using our minds, our, our consciousness. And of course, now this apogee can turn into uh, some sort of like a, a libertarian dystopia, like in Bioshock or something, right? <laughs> or at least that's the intentions. We, we have a bunch of uh, very libertarian warlocks, I, I suppose. Uh, Self-reliance. And, uh, you know, believe in charity of the, of the self. And, <laughs> oh, pardon me. <clears throat> I say that in a non-partisan non fashion. Uh, I'm not, I, I don't. Hey, Ginger Babe. King is making the solid point. Con uh, consider Fusoya. He becomes a puddle when he dies. Yeah, he just becomes sort of like a beard and a robe. As if he was made of some sort of flan. Lunarians invented pudding. Case closed. So says King Von Ale. Uh, in response to Aurora Rose, who was just saying that there was pudding or flan on the moon. <laughs> so here you have it, my friends. We've spent our, our two weeks of workshop to deliver so much content to you all here to come up with inspiration really unique societal um uh, a unique societal um well i guess just a unique society we'll keep it there you know or i guess societal influences a philosophy and even a genealogy right we're saying that humans are, are like the half breed the, the humans are the results of the two warring races that have been coming together under the guidance of this deity that's brought peace and, and unity to Apogea, that, the, that these warlocks are now undermining. Everything is in front of you, 
And so now it's up to you to decide where do you want to take this story. The map is here. The NPCs. And if you do find yourself truly in a pinch, again, crack open a DMG. It will hold your hand through this process. You know, it'll give you ideas and provide inspiration. And I'll tell you, just like you see, you want to talk about slowly building a story and going towards a philosophy? We primarily only use the three core rule books on this channel. How many times have we had a randomly generated character that was, oh, this is exactly the same as that other character we made? It has not happened, and we've been doing this for a year now. Because even with a similar set of charts and prompts, the unique circumstances, the interaction of all the parts are still going to make it unique and still be able to provide an interesting inspiration. You know, what happens in Apogea uh, can be its own, you know, world, or it could just be a corner of the world. Maybe it's a little bit more isolated. It could be the beginning of something, right? If if we go on to think that humans just, you know, are the most common race, you know, we're, we're extremely average. We're very well average. Uh, we're above average, even, in some cases. Um, maybe this, this is the tale. All humans originate from Apogea in, in its region. Because of the events that occur here, where humans are, are the, the, the pudding, the, the genetic pudding, right? The flan to be molded and shaped uh, and providing flavor. Because they are the distilled essence of the various other races that existed, but have all come together spiritually and physically in order to create a society that is not torn by strife. How about that? <laughs> All right, Aurora Rose. Yeah, thank you for the follow. Thank you for finding us and uh, and having some fun dialogue. Uh, be very well, and thank you for hanging out with us. Hopefully we'll see you again. Ginger, you, you, you like the idea? Well, I'm glad that you do. I, I know you just kind of came in at the tail end of us doing an overarching campaign outline, but this is the culmination of those two weeks of workshop that we've been working on. So I guess six days, you know, a Wednesday through Saturday and a Wednesday through Saturday. Well, you say that, Rhodium, but if the humans continue to grow and expand, look, humans don't stay in Apogea. Uh, humans go out and, uh, and they live everywhere. And uh, I'm sure we've seen enough... Uh, kind of tongue-in-cheek humor about uh, fantasy races that humans are uh, humans are very much a uh, genetically compatible uh, a, a, like a near like, humans are the universal donors of uh, genetic material amongst all the all the monstrous races uh, that exist <laughs> I'll keep it PG-13 and put it that way I'm sure we've seen enough comics or you know we, we've heard enough kind of snarky tales at the tabletop um, but you know what this could very well be the origin story of why that is humans as an entity didn't exist until this has like this happened and this cemented humanity as its own race being a distilled pudding of the other races that have just come together over time because of strife but under unity under uh, with understanding and overcoming strife you know, being a part of nature, but also being uh, th these uh, th to have the capability of having magical essence flow through you to be a druid, to be a wizard, to be a cleric or to be a cultist. You could your players are, are, could very well kill the, the lead cultist here or the, the warlock. Right. Bringing its own flavor of like divine nature yeah, it's sort of like as a, an amalgamation of the three different types of magic um, but did the patron survive or did they kill the patron but the leader fled and of course ideas live on well after the body you know the body that was preaching him dies the ideas can still live on in people and that sets up strife for later and so this is a tale that happens as a precursor to any of your others that you that you tell at your tabletop. And you don't have to tell this one first. In fact, you can have a very powerful imp impact if you tell that story in your third or fourth campaign in a consistent world. Because now you're going back in time. 
you're revealing how did it all happen. And Orc says Fluffy Sheep. King says every fantasy race can breed with anything. Just look at how much dragon blood is it. Well, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Numonica said, hey, Numonica, half human, half cream, half elemental, half dragon. And that's not even the most severe I've seen. <coughs> and also, howdy. And Goblin Slayer learned that day that the real monsters were the humans. King has three half-dragon templates on him right now. Look, in Ravnica, we have an elf ooze. <laughs> oh, for a while, in our in our store, we kept uh, public EDH decks. So people who, you know, might not have been able to, uh, to afford building an EDH deck uh, could borrow, you know, it's, it's, is it going to win a tournament or something? No. It's a solid, fun deck that we built uh, to be thematic. Um, and so, you know, people could go up and, and ask to, to run it. Um, but uh, uh, one of them was Experiment Kraj, and it, that, that was a fun deck. <laughs> King to Derek, you leave my half ooze child alone. Uh <coughs> <laughs> all right well we've discussed the storytelling all the tools have been set in front of you as um you know so instead of me just typing everything out I've, I've typed a lot here but i also took it back you know if you're paying attention or you watch the vod later on youtube but here's this challenge here's all the materials and the source book which can help you tie it all together have this be your story just because I put words down here, you could have a completely different philosophy and run something different. And so this is still going to get uploaded to our past content channel. And it's done, it's done so in good faith. Because now it's up to you and your imagination to take the villains we've created, to take the NPCs, the map, the cultural concepts, and to put it together in a way that makes sense for you and for the story you want to tell. And if you need some help, Go to the DMG. It's all right here for you. You can also ask a mentor in our, our workshop if you want to. Uh, Ginger, you say, I feel like you're typing in tongues. Wait, was that to me or was that to the banter going on right now? Derek. The banter, okay. So I'm gonna get up and I'm gonna take a five minute stretch break. I'm gonna maybe grab another another uh, nice cherry, uh, nice diet cherry soda. Get up, stretch my back a little, wiggle around, and uh, we can continue to banter. Have some table talk. Uh, if any of you want to give a home, I have three boxes of speaking of Ravnik. I have three boxes of Ravnica left, and two boxes of Dragon Heist. We could pop open some boxes if any of you want to adopt them. Uh, but let's get up, take a five-minute break, and when we come back, congratulations on a on a wonderful uh, workshop week that ties everything up, uh, the, all the, the fun, the conversation, and uh, creation that we've had. <laughs> 